Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Eric Townell. Today, my guests are Eric Baer and Juliana Athade, co-artistic directors of the Society for Chamber Music in Rochester. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. We're not in the studio today. We're in the beautiful Lyric Theater, Rochester Lyric Theater, a new venue for music here in the neighborhood of the arts in Rochester. So this is a great place to visit with you today, and uh, it'll be really fun to hear the Society for Chamber Music in this space at one time. Absolutely, absolutely. One of our big things right now is searching for new and interesting venues, and this certainly mm -hmm. fits the bill. Mm -hmm. um, we have been for a long time at the Memorial Art Gallery, and about three years ago, some things came up. They're having some renovations, some asbestos issues. So we started looking around for different venues, and so um, this certainly fits into what we like. I think it would be great for our audience. It's a great location. Um, as you know, we moved recently for two of our five concerts to the Strathallen Hotel. Oh, yes. And very different venue for many of our patrons. Um, it, as it's spa it's space itself, it's not really designed to be a concert venue, but Juliana brought her violin along mm -hmm. to a lot of venues we went to and uh, were amazed at how good the acoustics were. Uh -huh. And it adds incredible views up there on the ninth floor. We did one in the... Um, at the end of the summer, and then we just did one uh, November, so the four colors were on display, uh. and that was gorgeous. So that's a great, great space, and we've got a lot of feedback. We've really sort of switched um, our model a little bit with the society to really hearing back, doing surveys via Survey Monkey or any kind of thing like that, mm -hmm. and getting back information what people like, what they don't like, and really sort of tailoring much more the concert experience to what people really want, as opposed to just sitting them down somewhere and saying, enjoy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we found that really kind of interesting, and um, this is gorgeous in here. So Rochester has a lot of interesting places to play. Yeah, this is my first time in here, and I think it's absolutely stunning. I mean, the woodwork and the windows and just kind of the theater in the round feel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think a, a concert in here would be great. And I think it's one of the few buildings that maybe people haven't been into uh, yet. Right. So to get a glimpse in here and sort of a, a sense of the history of this neighborhood is a great thing. Well, we're glad you feel at home. You know, it seems like the kind of space that chamber music would be right at home in, the, the kind of space where it was originally played, for instance. Absolutely. And this stage, you know, everyone has such a wonderful view. And you can even hear with our speaking that there's a resonance here with all of the wood. I think it would be great. I think so too, and especially okay. seeing as you know, our mission is to bring uh, the faculty and Eastman and the, the, the professionals in the RPO together for chamber music. Um, they'd feel very much at home if they just looked up at the ceiling here. They'd feel they were back in their usual working office. How about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think they'd feel very comfortable here. A nice connection. Very nice connection. So, I was surprised to learn that the Society for Chamber Music is 40 years old this year. <laughs> Older than we are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's been true. around a long time. Yeah, we're very... Um, we're very proud of everybody that um, actually some of the people on our board were there from the beginning. We're very proud to be a part of this long tradition. It's a very old, um, relatively speaking, for chamber music in America. And uh, it's been around for 40 years. It was started um, by members of the RPO, in fact. Oh. And mm -hmm. uh, we've actually been in touch with a couple of people that knew them um, and, and some of the wives of them that are still around. And so. It's, it's just got a long tradition of people that are still involved. Of course, now we've got an eye on the future, and we're trying to figure out how do we keep it going as strong, if not stronger, for the next 40 years. Yes. Uh -huh. So that's <laughs> sort of the, the challenge now. And um, so that's why we've done a lot of different things, changing our venue, perhaps changing some of the structure of how it runs, reaching out to the elusive younger audience. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it, what we found out, actually, uh, through just actually having an intern this year, mm -hmm. um, the younger people just sometimes don't know about things. Uh -huh. And getting the word out is just half the challenge. And once the words are, we've noticed a, a huge uptick in, in young students coming to our concerts. It's been great. We actually offer free student admission. Oh, that's just fantastic. Unwritten by the board, which is great. Mm -hmm. So we have noticed that um, the kids, once they hear about it, they say, well, that's really, I'd love to hear my professor. Mm -hmm. Or I'd love to see you know, so-and-so from the RPO play a chamber music thing, how uh -huh. different. Uh -huh. So we've been finding, um, especially getting feedback, as I mentioned, from surveys from the audience, how you can really engage with today's concert goer, which is uh -huh. so different to that subscription model that we used to have, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, where people would buy the subscription and that would just be there every other month, go to a chain music concert deal. Mm -hmm. We've um, changed that too. Now we have flexible packages. We allow people to tailor more. Uh, I see. So, you know, just finally we're catching up to the business world, it feels like, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> I think we learned that it isn't enough to just have great music mm. uh -huh. because, you know, 
people have busy lives and, and what things can we do that will um, help entice them to come. And so, of course, the biggest draws are still the, the music, the programming, and the performers, but um, venues, time of day, day of the week, uh, you know, ease of parking, all of these things. So we try to take all of those things into account to make the concert going experience as enjoyable as it can be for for our patrons and for new um, listeners. Especially for new listeners too, because mm -hmm. they'll say, well, what is chamber music? They say, was that a, is that a chamber orchestra? No, it's not that. It's So we thought, well, we could say small groups of people playing nice music, but that's too <laughs> long. Um, so we have to sort of educate a little bit what chamber music is, uh -huh. you know, it's between two and 12 or 15 people playing. Um, no conductor, mm -hmm. uh, and at once people sort of get a clue about, oh, there's no conductor, how does that work? And then they start <laughs> getting really interested in that. Because I think sometimes with chamber music, you can see much more of the individual personality, and I think people are really attracted to that now very much. You know, we've moved away from sort of institutional thinking in some sense, and it's more about individual basis. So I feel like the audience is very drawn to chamber music now, mm -hmm. um, even if they aren't really aware of what it is. So once we get them through the door, um, they suddenly go, well, this is really cool. You guys are all your own bosses, and you're making uh -huh. decisions, and there's no one waving a stick. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, and I think especially because of the society's nature that we feature local musicians, yeah. people that come to the concerts, they may not know everyone on stage, but they do recognize a fair number of the people and they feel connected to them, maybe from seeing them perform at Eastman or with the RPO. Yeah. And so then to be able to see them in another setting, they really enjoy that. And that's sort of the uniqueness that perhaps sets us apart from other chamber music presenting organizations is that we don't bring in preformed groups. Every concert we do is a one-off opportunity to hear individual great artists within our community to perform. And once that concert's over, it's done. It'll never be repeated, and you'll probably never hear those people in that configuration playing that program ever again. So it's a lot more work for us, of course, yeah. but um, <laughs> it leads to these unique collaborations between people that don't usually work together. And right. so, you know, you, you can have a favorite cello person on the faculty and a wonderful flute player in the orchestra that never get together. Uh -huh. We put them together and magic can happen. So we love that. And, you know, along with getting the younger audiences, when I say younger, I mean, you know, anybody under 50, frankly, you uh -huh. know, is very young. Uh -huh. And we love doing wine, wine pairings and wine tastings, too. Uh -huh. So sort of that gets people in the door because they say, well, I like wine. And uh -huh. they come for that. And then they go, well, I like the concert, too. So, you know, we, we try and have a little bit of fun with it, really, uh -huh. because um, it is so much more informal than perhaps big concerts. Uh, uh -huh. People are closer to us, uh -huh. like they would be right here. There's so much closer people, there's much more intimate venues that mm -hmm. we can do. And because we don't have you know, a big um, uh, bargaining contracts to worry about, we can sort of change our model very, very quickly. If we get feedback and get an idea, maybe come to a wonderful interview in an interesting space, we can say, right, we can try that, mm -hmm. which is really fun for us because sometimes you know, the larger the organization, the harder it is to turn the ship. Yes. So we're pretty agile, which is really fun. That is fun. Now, what kind of music are people likely to hear if they come to a chamber music concert? I would say anything and everything, really. Mm -hmm. um, they might hear woodwinds, they might hear brass, they might hear strings, mm -hmm. with or without piano. Uh, usually concerts um, are kind of centered around one group of musicians. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't come to one of our concerts and hear a brass quintet followed by a string quartet followed by a, a, a piano duo. Uh -huh. So, you know, we'll be focusing on, on one group, but our concerts really have covered everything from Baroque to contemporary jazz. Uh -huh. So we, we try to throw in something for everyone. Um, one of our upcoming concerts that Eric is going to be featured on has a, a commissioned oboe quartet that you could tell yeah, us Yeah, I'm about. really excited about this. Adam Roberts is a composer that um, studied here at Eastman, and mm -hmm. now he's going out in the world doing great things. He just won a Guggenheim Fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we commissioned him before he won, so we didn't get the <laughs> Guggenheim Prize. Uh, he's lovely, and he was just on the phone with me the other week saying, how do I you know, do this? And he's got all these great ideas that he wants to do. He just gave me a, uh, the first movement, and it looks wonderful. And so he kind of uh, thought about this in terms of how can he pair it with something? And mm -hmm. uh, Jim Willie, who commissioned it, said, well, I love the Mozart oboe quartet. So that's oboe, violin, viola, cello. Uh -huh. And this needs to be sort of a companion-ish work to that. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, I don't know if Adam's drawn anything from Mozart. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's written right today. So it's very contemporary. It's wonderful. 
but there might be some influences that I'm not seeing that he'll explain to me. And I just love that we're able to do that, that we can find a masterpiece mm -hmm. and say, here's one of the great works of the oboe literature, the Mozart Oboe Quartet, and now we've commissioned something completely new, relevant, and wonderful. And that's kind of what we, we're striving to do, is be able to say, come and enjoy the Brahms, and then we're going to present to you something that you've never heard. Uh -huh. It may be brand new, or maybe from 300 years ago, and you never knew about it, right. and you're going to love it. Uh -huh. So. You know, so I, I hope we've sort of built that trust with our audience that even if they don't know the pieces, um, they, 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 they love them. And there were a few concerts we did where they came in saying, well, I'm not going to like this. And they walked away. Or they didn't come. And then their friends called them and said, you should have been there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's, you know, kind of what we're trying to do. Just yes. sort of open. I think Rochester has an incredibly sophisticated um, musical agree. audience. Mm -hmm. I was struck by that when I moved here from Houston, which is a far larger city. But I was just straight away in my first season of the RPO, I was getting emails from people in the public pointing out small things, commenting very nicely on things. But I thought, wow, this is very cultured and very educated. Uh -huh. So I think we, um, we don't want to play too safe because I, I think our, our audiences can handle some adventure. So uh, creation of new works is part of the mission of the uh, yeah. society? It really is. In mm -hmm. fact, um, along with you know, the main thing of combining the faculty and the, and the RPO together, is also um, our outreach program. We go to schools. And then the third uh, mission is our concerto competition. Uh oh, every composer, year. Yeah. Composer, yeah. So our com composition uh, competition where we have a high school division. Uh -huh. So we get submissions all from within New York State. They have to be either living here or going to school. And so we have a high school winner every year. And then every other year, we have the college division oh, winner. I see. Alternating years. Yes. Alternating years. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I think we're very proud of some of the people that are coming out of New York or going to school in New York or going on in their careers doing amazing things. We're seeing their names pop up now, um, doing great work. And we get them when they're young. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so what we've done with this is kind of had a look at it and say, how can we make this an even better experience? Because perhaps when you go to a bunch of hardworking professionals and say, here's a young composer's winning work, which is great, but perhaps it needs a little help or it's written in a difficult way. Um, professionals have to spend an awful lot of time deciphering how it should go, uh, practicing that. And, and, and on a program that we've put them on, yeah. that will be in addition to them preparing major works from the literature. So we're saying to them, can you also prepare oh. this? So we had this idea to um, engage with students at Eastman. Ah. And so we work with the chamber music department there and uh -huh. we get, you know, what, for whatever the piece uh, is scored, we get students from Eastman that will yeah. come and perform the work. And so now we have this great interplay between young composers and young musicians and they're all forming these great relationships, they're staying in touch. And I think it teaches both parties so much about kind of what they're going to get into later in life. So. Builds their network for when they enter the professional world. Exactly. That's right. I mean, we're trying to say to them already, think of yourself as a professional because you're going to, you know, be with these, growing up with these people in your, in your world, you know, and it's going to be great for you to know them from when you're young. And it's great. I mean, the feedback that they will give to the composer uh -huh. is great too. And then the composer will give them feedback too and uh -huh. work with them as well. So I think um, I'm very excited about it. We've had two, two seasons now we've brought in an Eastman group for performing the, uh, the competition piece, and they've loved it. We've loved having them. So, so for people at home who might not have been at the Philharmonic, uh, you're both principal players of the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, principal violin or the concertmaster, and mm -hmm. principal oboe, the leading uh, musicians in that ensemble. And so, uh, tell us, is string quartet something you in particularly enjoy? Is that a nice break from the orchestra? Or, you know, or? I really do love playing chamber music, and I think that both of us really strive to create chamber music in the orchestra, which mm -hmm. some people might think, well, how can you do that? There's almost 100 people on stage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the principles were always trying to connect visually with each other and musically so that even though there are so many of us and we do have a conductor, we all want to contribute to that artistic process. Yes, uh -huh. um, and so what I really love about then getting to play chamber music is kind of like Eric was saying, with a smaller organization, you can turn the boat more quickly. The same is true of a small group of musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, we might just decide on, on a moment's notice in the performance, let's try it this way. And you can do it. With an orchestra, you'd want to be a little more careful. Little more you don't want to run away without the rest of the violin section. <laughs> so I really enjoy the balance of, of doing both. So how do you rehearse a small uh, ensemble where there really isn't a designated decider, for instance? That's a great that question. That is a great question. That's a great question. And you know, we've asked some, um, 
some famous quartet, Juliana's uh, teacher, Bill Prussell, was first violin in the Cleveland Quartet, one of the most famous quartets in the world. And um, we often asked him, you know, who, who, who was the boss? Who, uh -huh. How did they work it out? Because it, it must be very interesting knowing these people so well for years and years and years. And he said they would go to restaurants sometimes and sit apart from each other at different tables just to have a break. <laughs> but, um, you, you would think, well, maybe the first violin, that would be the boss. Mm -hmm. But not, not always, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems to be different in every group. Yeah, I think it changes. And I think it's all about really knowing the personalities. I mean, typically violinists and mm. first violinists yeah. are known for a certain uh -huh. what would be the word they like to they like to talk a, a lot. certain oh. presence <laughs> a certain, a certain presence, presence. Right. Right. um and so yeah. you know maybe the person playing second violin or the person playing viola is is slightly more demure but they've got a really fiery musical personality mm -hmm. and so i think in chamber music it's all about highlighting everyone's individual personality and probably in the end a final performance doesn't represent any one view, mm. but an amalgamation of all of them, which is even better than any of the original ideas. Uh -huh. So That's always a fun thing, when, when an idea is presented in a chamber music group, and, and then everyone kind of has their take on it, and the way it's kind of like a game of telephone, how the story <laughs> changes. And you may end up with something that was different than what the original person wanted to do, but it is better. Ah, yes. It is better, because it's been gone through sort of a democratic process, where people <laughs> have all added what they wanted to add. Uh -huh. um, you know, perhaps a larger group, you know, if you have a very big, perhaps 10 or 12 people, you maybe wanted to sort of rely on a few people. Otherwise, it gets a little unwieldy for everybody to have comments all the time. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but certainly, I think for smaller groups, you know, everyone can get their say. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes I find the people that say the least and are the quietest have the most profound impact when they, mm -hmm. when they oh, have interesting, something to say. Interesting. Now, do you use piano frequently? Yep, we, yes. we do. We use piano quite a lot. Um, two, of, two of the five this year are without piano. and then the Yeah, I would say are. it tends to be at least half of the concerts uh -huh. because it just adds so uh -huh. much when uh -huh. we can have piano yeah. um, and our venues except the Strathallen which of course we've been doing string concerts because oh, yeah. they don't have a piano up there uh -huh. um, Hochstein has a wonderful yeah. uh, choice of pianos actually so it, it would seem a shame to exclude that from our repertoire so whenever we can we try to combine as many forces. Now you mentioned the Hochstein School for Music and Dance right yes. here in Rochester, right? Now, do you have a favorite pianist that you enjoy working with or is part of your staff? Well, funny you mention that, actually, <laughs> because this year we just started a new thing uh, uh -oh. in our 40 year history. We have um, our distinguished guest artist, uh, John Nakamatsu. Oh, and this yes. is the first year we're doing that. Um, somebody from within the community came forward and said, I'd like to sponsor this. And, we thought, now, who would be our favorite distinguished guest artist? And he was the first name that came to mind. Because John is just a wonderful guy. He's sort of the adopted pianist of Rochester, it feels like. Uh -huh. um, he's performed <laughs> so many times at the RPO. Yeah. He's a fantastic pianist, a Van Cliburn winner. And first and foremost, he's a great human being. Uh -huh. And we're fortunate to be friends with him. So we reached out immediately saying, John, would you consider being this? And he said, of course, great. What do I need to do? And, you know, wow. he's on board. Uh -huh. um, so we love playing with John whenever we can. But unfortunately, he lives in California. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but we have so many favorite pianists here. I mean, Barry Snyder comes to mind. Of mm. course, Joe Werner was artistic director for many years. Yes. Chao Wen. Chao Wen Chang, who was a former student of Barry Snyder's. Oh. Yeah. She's become a frequent co collaborator of ours. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. so we're very fortunate we have, you know, a number of them here. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know. Uh -huh. In a way, that's the hardest part for us is selecting the musicians. The program <laughs> sort of, they sort of come They come up. together. Uh -huh. But then we've got so many friends that we just think are great, we'd love to have. It's very hard. We have to sort of say, well, you're on the other year cycle. Uh -huh. so we yeah. actually used, did we count that we used five cellists in right. five different programs this right. year. And right. there were still cellist friends of ours that we said, I'm so sorry, we, we want to have you yeah. next year. Uh, so uh, you just can never fit everyone, but what an embarrassment of riches. Uh -huh. So you mentioned five concerts this year. Is that a pretty typical year for you, a season? Yeah, we do five or six. Uh -huh. um, this year it's five and uh, it, it feels nice and manageable. And I think that... Um, you we kind of take a break during that uh, kind of Arctic freeze uh -huh. that we have in Rochester. And it's nice. So we do two in the fall, and then we've got three in the spring, and it kind of gives people a little break in the middle, but yeah. we sort of get, get going And again. we don't really have a mandate, you know, for any specific kind of music, really, um, other than it being 
you know, chamber good music, music, good mm. chamber music. You know, we can do modern jazz, we can do baroque. The one concert we do generally try and do one of a year is baroque, and um, that's always an interesting thing. I think in a town like Rochester that has fantastic performance uh, period performance groups like like Pegasus. Um, we're doing it on modern instruments. So uh -huh. the difference being, obviously, this is music written 350 years ago. We're playing it on an oboe that was made yesterday, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, we always, every year we think about that and, you know, try and inform from period performance practice ideas, but give it the modern touch. Uh -huh. And this year, we actually, Juliana came up with a great idea. She said, well, let's call it Bach to the Future. So she, we looked <laughs> yuck, at all yuck, these. Yuck, 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 you know. But, um, <laughs> It's What's, that presence. Yeah. <laughs> What's original in the concept is looking at Bach and looking at him through the eyes of great composers. So ah. it's not just Bach. It's Bach arranged by Rachmaninoff. Uh -huh. Bach arranged by, you know, Claude Beethoven. Be Beethoven, Claude uh -huh. Bolling. You know, uh -huh. looking looking at how composers have viewed Bach's music. It's primarily Bach as a source material, but they'll add their own personalities to it. Uh -huh. And I think that's always fascinating because there's such reverence for this man, this great man that right. was around so many years ago. And the reverence comes from the composers, these great composers. Uh -huh. And how many composers can you say, you know, that their, their music continues to live on and continues to evolve? You know, the, the Bach cello suites are played by everyone from violists to marimba players. Uh -huh. yeah. So, you know, just taking a look at kind of how wide that influence is. And uh, we have done Baroque concerts where we did Bach, Brandenburg, and uh, Zelenka sonatas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we thought this would be kind of a, a unique perspective that we could offer to our audience. And so do you discuss these programs between your co-artistic directors? <laughs> uh, this is an interesting process. Yes, yeah. we make sure to have a conference call every year. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we sit around the dining table and sort of throughout the season ideas pop up and we, uh -huh. we'll put it on the phone and try and put in a little list, try and remember it. So um, It might happen over dinner with our toddler, but yeah. you know, we're always coming up with something. But yeah, you know, we, we come up with the idea and then it morphs into something else and something else and eventually it kind of halfway resembles what we wanted in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But we try and also get a little bit of the musician input too. Um, especially say if we had a John Nakamatsu coming, we'd say, John, what do you want to play? Uh, Here's yeah. an idea, what do you yeah. think? You know? um, but other, compo other uh, musicians have been great too. We did a little around the world tour. We went to different areas from the world and presented music from that and tied it into wine tastings from that. It was very fun. But it kind of got challenging when we got to Asia because oh. <laughs> that, was, that was challenging, first of all. It's a very large scope <laughs> of, <laughs> of work. But we had a lot of the performers who were coming and, um, and they came up with great ideas. So although we, we had sort of a skeleton idea of what the concert would be, they really filled in the, the meat of that and made it really made it, fleshed it out I for understand. us. So we can be collaborative that way, which is really fun. Um, but generally, yeah, we just sit around uh, February and start thinking about the following season uh -huh. um, and thinking about what we can also do to tie it to Rochester a little bit. We love featuring, of course, the musicians are our own Rochester uh -huh. born and bred, but we love featuring our local composers if we can, not just our concerto winners, but maybe faculty or people that have moved on. So we look at that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's sort of topical things going on in the world right now that we can't ignore and that, you know, you can do music that might bring about discussion of it or perhaps alleviate worry or examine issues. And I think that, that um, the role of the artist isn't to ignore, you know, we're not politicians, we don't need to talk about it. But, but embrace and kind of help people yeah. work through it in whatever yeah. way. So, you know, there are big things going on in the world right now. And so I think, you know, sometimes we're looking at concerts thinking, how can we in a subtle and gracious way highlight things or, or causes we think that are humanitarian in nature or that are good. Um, and, you know, so we start looking at stuff like that. I mean, that's, you know, a little heavy, but, but um, generally we're just trying to present a wonderful afternoon of music that people come to and enjoy and they, they go home stimulated and if we can get them to think a little bit, that's great too. Wonderful. Now, you know, there's an interesting movement right now of bringing chamber music back to people's living rooms mm -hmm. where you have a micro concert. Any interest in this or have you experience with this? Well, or? absolutely. Yes, yeah. and I, I know that, uh, you know, a lot of students are taking part in this. We have many friends uh, in the Cleveland Orchestra where um, they've actually developed a close relationship with a uh, a hot dog joint <laughs> and a bar where uh -huh. they present 
classical chamber music Fantastic. and people love it and they have a real following so you know i think that's also part of our idea of like okay what kind of space would have enough room for us and the people because you know we can't all get into a, a tiny little place but if we could find the room for it i think that's really exciting you know it's a, an experience in a place where people don't expect it. Mm -hmm. And that stimulates a lot of conversation also. It's great, it's really great. And, and what I've really enjoyed seeing a lot of the groups going and doing this, especially in California, I'm seeing a lot of them in San Francisco, they're going out there and they're playing great, I mean, masterworks of our repertoire. They're not dumbing it down, they're not bringing some silly arrangement of popular tunes. They're going out there and they're saying, we're gonna give you a movement of, of a Beethoven quartet. And it's great. And, and crowds that perhaps have never heard a string quartet just love it. They instantly love this music, which is validating to all of us involved in this field because we're saying, hey, this music is great and people just need to be exposed to it. And they'll say, man, that's just cool. And I love it. I think that's you know kind of um, perhaps a way to reclaim an audience that has been a little bit lost uh, yes. to TV and a little bit lost. Uh -huh. You know, perhaps orchestras got away from reaching out as much as they should because things were going okay, perhaps for a while, but I think we're sort of getting back in there. And I hate to say it's education because it's not education. It's just offering an experience that people haven't had mm -hmm. and perhaps they've drifted away from. And as soon as they have that, they seem mm -hmm. to just love it and want it again. Exposure at very least. Exposure, yeah. Yes. And it seems to be a good business model too. I mean, especially for college students. Uh -huh. you, know, I, uh -huh. you know, you can go out and you can have a little chamber music group come and play. You pay them each 50 bucks. And uh -huh. They get to practice performing in front of people in an yes, intimate important. environment, which is very useful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have some ideas here too where we're trying to look at not even in terms of a ticketed concert, but just sort of a, as part of our outreach, uh, which we have yeah. some funds for very mm -hmm. generously given to us, that we can perhaps look at a few bars or a few places in the area that uh -huh. you might see us Restaurants, in coffee shops. Well, yeah. I'll follow you around. Keep an eye out. <laughs> now, uh, you mentioned earlier a uh, school program, the, you, the composer contest, and then also some mm -hmm. outreach into schools. Uh, describe what's going on there a little bit. Yeah, we, we go into schools. Um, we, As Eric was saying, we have these funds for outreach, and we try to identify schools that would um, benefit from and enjoy our presence and so we'll go in and we'll take a concert that we're performing and either go in right before mm -hmm. ideally right before the concert so that maybe the students might say hey mom dad I want to go to this concert and by the way I get in free because I'm a student mm -hmm. and so we'll go into a school and we'll we'll play a, a smaller version of the concert mm -hmm. you know a few movements of things talk to the students and then um, we also offer the schools that we'd be happy to stay and do master classes oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. so we'll do individual instrument classes or maybe we coach some of their chamber groups and um, we find that you know you can be at all different kinds of socioeconomic groups of schools but the reaction from the students is the same they're just as engaged and really interested and I personally find it most rewarding to play for students who really wouldn't have the opportunity to be exposed to this you know um, kids whose parents who are you know dragging them off to the ballet and all of that you know they they get it too so if people want to learn more about the society and become involved uh, how would they do that well i think the best place to start would be online um okay. chambermusicrochester.org is our, uh, is our web address chambermusicrochester.org and um, they can go there there are many links to sort of look at our concerts look at the mission statement um, they can get involved. ways to be involved if yeah they want. Mm -hmm. absolutely um, ways to be involved we are always looking for more people to be involved mm -hmm. if you um, think your child's school might be a good place for us to come we'd love to come and uh -huh. visit them if you know any young people that love composing direct them to our website well, that's so exciting to have you here in the Rochester Lyric Theater and so exciting to hear about what you're doing at the Society for Chamber Music in Rochester. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. have been wonderful guests. My guests have been Juliana Athade and Eric Baer. They are co-artistic directors of the Society for Chamber Music in Rochester. This has been In the Spotlight. I'm Eric Townell. Thanks for joining us.